Yeah, good evening, wildlifers. Welcome you all uh, for uh, one more session uh, from our end. So uh, you are all familiar uh, now by now that we meet on the fifth day of uh, every month on a virtual platform. Uh, we are a global group of uh, uh, enthusiasts and uh, uh, wildlife conservation is what we support. Today, uh, we have amidst us uh, uh, an achiever, um, Sumant Kudwalli. Uh, he is an award-winning natural history filmmaker from Bengaluru, uh, holds a filmmaking diploma from Delhi, formerly a technical executive at Nikon India Private Limited, he now excels as a freelance natural history cameraman. With remarkable contributions to Indian wildlife filmmaking, Sumant has partnered with many renowned production houses, including Felis Creations and Mud Skipper. Notably, he filmed for BBC's Wonders of the Monsoon and Wild Karnataka, narrated by Sir David Attenborough. As a pioneer, as a pioneering cameraman, he captured the rare Sangi for the documentary. The Return of Sangi, Suman's directorial debut, the Naga Pride in collaboration with Gypsy Tiger Productions and Wildlife Institute of India earned accolades across eight countries and received 12 global nominations, including a top Indian documentary award at Nagaon International Film Festival. His conservation-focused work, Communities and Sustainability, in collaboration with ATRI, was recognized at prominent film festivals, endorsed by Vigyan Prasar and CMS Vathavaran. Sumanth is a Jackson Wild Collective member and distinguished fellow of the Jackson Wild Collective. His ongoing project, Forgotten Foods, a coffee table book, explores eco-friendly food practices among Kaveri River Basin tribes addressing climate change. His upcoming short film, Land of Commons, cultivated during the Jackson Wild uh, Fellowship Program with BBC producer Simon Baxter's assistance, underscores his commitment to impactful storytelling. In 2019, Sumanth co-founded Trailing Wild Productions, a platform poised to elevate Indian wildlife globally. Beyond showcasing captivating fauna, the initiative uniquely fosters conservation by connecting grassroots conservationists and organizations with vital resources. With a vision, to enrich both media and conservation landscapes, Suman's team at Trailing Wild Productions strives to amplify India's wildlife and conservation narratives, forging a harmonious future for its rich biodiversity. Welcome, Suman. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sanjay. That was a wonderful introduction. I probably could not put, have put it uh, as well as you just did right now. And thank you for all of you joining across the globe uh, for this particular evening. It really means a lot to us. So with much, without much ado, I think I'll start uh, my presentation. And uh, I'll be more than glad to take questions, whatever it is at the end of it, uh, of the uh, presentation. So thank you for your patience in between. Right. So as uh, Sanjay mentioned in the introduction, what we are trying to do is to empower conservation through filmmaking. And this will be the agenda for the evening. I'd like to start off with a quote. I'm sorry. Is my am I audible to everybody? Yes, sorry. Please okay. go ahead. Let somebody in between. All right. Okay. So this quote by the great man David Attenborough kind of is apt for 
the right moment at this at this very moment more than ever before i think uh, today we are standing in the midst of a situation where each one of us has to start caring for the nature for for wildlife and for climate together wherever we are so as early as in 2001 films for conservation had become a thing like we had filmmakers in india who had started to do conservation films uh, up until then it was films that were to do with uh, natural history the beauty of the nature to tell us that there was there was a space of wildlife that was slightly apart from where we were living but by 2001 we were reaching a stage where we had to voice out the issues that nature was facing in itself one of the pioneering films that uh, took up such a story was mindless mining by shekhar dattatri in 2001 which shook the world as it saw these images of uh, how the land was being plundered by human activities until up then the conservationists had taken up uh, the fight at, in the court of law to stop mining in kudremuk uh, na 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 national park in karnataka but all efforts had gone in vain until these images made it possible for the supreme court to look at it from a very different view and and eventually a ban was uh, put on the mining in kudremuk so this was the start of a, a kind of a revolution for wildlife and films were playing a big role in it by the end of the decade and this started way earlier than i started my career as a filmmaker in 2010 a decade later in 2011 i had the unique opportunity to co assist shekhar dattatri in taking his another con conservation film the truth about tigers across karnataka uh, to showcase it to different kinds of people different segments of people starting from uh, uh, power, powerful people like the politicians to students to graduates to a whole lot of teachers and judges and everybody else what this did was not only inspire me to look beyond blue chip and naturalistic documentary filmmaking but also give me a sense of what really conservation issues were in the land and how i as a filmmaker could make a big difference and by the end of 2014 we I had started collaborating with a lot of people and we were doing documentaries, a uh, series of documentaries actually for conservation using state of the art technology. What that meant was this series of documentaries that came along from 2014 onwards were not just visually appealing, but also were telling a very important story about the conservation issues that our country faced and also helping the scientists who are fighting these battles out there in the field to have an opinion that had proof and that could be then set out and told to the community or to the uh, powerful ministers or to the judges as to what the issue was and they could get uh, things done. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about conservation filmmaking is the fact is that this does not require an enormous amount of budget or enormous amount of equipment or you huge number of working days in the field to come up with beautiful narratives. But what you require is a little amount of time and an imagination and some networking to get this done. I'll just play a short video, which we created in 2019 in the middle of the pandemic or 2020 rather in the middle of the pandemic when the rest of the world was shut down, but we could still do a video. The great Indian horn business is one of the larger members of the Hornbill family and the largest in the Indian subcontinent. They are found throughout the Western Ghats and the Northeastern states of India. Its impressive size, along with its prominent large beak and a yellow cask, makes it one of the most striking birds. From afar, both male and female Hornbills look alike, but there are differences. The male is slightly bigger than the female, has red eyes and sports a yellow and black cast. The female, on the other hand, has plain yellow cast and white eyes. Hornbills feed on fruits and seeds of several tree species and help in dispersing them across the landscape. Hence, they are also known 
as the farmers of the forest. Hornbills mate for life, and their courtship is a vocal of them. Once the mating is done, the female finds a tree cavity to nest. Here, she seals herself, leaving only a small opening for the male to feed her from. For the next four months, she and the chicks rely entirely on the male for food. To have a healthy population of this majestic bird, it is crucial to have landscapes that continue to support a large number of big trees. It is now time to join hands to save our forests and the great Indian hornbill. So, what I would like to really emphasize here is the fact is that conservation films could be made when you were just sitting home with all the footage that we had. And sometimes we just didn't even need footage. We just could do it with animations. But these had long-term implications when it comes to conservation uh, being taken forward on the field. Well, at the same time, while we were doing this, what really happened was we were networking with a host num whole number of people who would then be really helpful to take forward things in the conservation scene on the field with us. So by 2014 and between, between 2014 and 2019 and beyond, we were work, working with all these individuals and all these organizations here. And this was helping us take the conservation leap forward. But then again, there was one thing that was in my mind is like while filming for conservation was a good deed and we were trying to take this envelope forward for conservation, there's something more we could do. And that something more is what we wanted to do. And there is where we started Trailing Wild Productions. So at Trailing Wild Productions, we make, product, uh, we make documentary films and we are based out of Bangalore. And we network with scientists, filmmakers, on-field associates, technology professionals, and the list goes on. What we, what we do here is work and collaborate with the government other production houses, research organizations, individuals, and whoever that works in the conservation space and try to bring out stories that is untold before. And the motto with, in our company is to bridge the gap between the scientific community and the social society through equity, diversity, and inclusivity. So why we actually came upon this was, has to go back slightly. Uh, this was during my early days as a wildlifer and less as a filmmaker, when I used to work with different organizations. Uh, and we used to do something called line transects with these uh, organizations where we would be walking around in, uh, in the forest trying to an analyze uh, animal populations. And then we used to do something called uh, human wildlife conflict surveys. So all of the scientific surveys that were being held around in this place uh, used, to used to need volunteers and I used to volunteer one of them. So one of the uh, events that really struck me was during one of my uh, volunteering activities with the Center for Wildlife Studies in and around BR Hills in Karnataka. Here we were trying to understand the reasons for human wildlife conflict around in the villages. And oh, the, uh, re the procedure of it was to actually ask people to identify the animals that they found in their forest we used to have a catalog of pictures that people had to identify from. Most of the people who, and these people were living on the periphery of the forest, tribals, most of them, and barely could identify one or two animals in the whole catalog of uh, species that we were carrying with us. But somehow, 
each of them could tell, ask us why there was no giraffes or hippopotamuses or rhinoceros or orangutans in their uh, backyard. That's got me thinking as to how was that these people actually know about these all animals that is not found in India, but they have so little clue or so little sense of what is actually there in your backyard, which probably they would see on a regular basis. And the answer to it was that on the mainstream media, we have been fed with all of these documentaries uh, on BBC or National Geographic or any other uh, platform for that instance of African wildlife or of Amazonian wildlife, which tends to show all of these things. The, uh, the Indonesian islands are shown, the Fiji islands are shown and all of these, but very little of the Indian wildlife is shown on our mainstream media. And partly is the reason is because of what happens on the field and to do with their marketing strategies. So then it came to my understanding is that unless we start showing things to our own people, the land and the life of our own forests, we are nowhere going to do conservation at all. It's because if they don't know what exists in their own backyard, they're not going to do much about saving them. So that is the idea behind trying to bring all the scientific, beautiful work that was happening in our country onto the mainstream media, if possible, or at least onto the media where our own people could watch it and then understand and appreciate what was there in our backyard. Then that was something that led us to uh, forming uh, trailing wild productions. But while we are doing so, we also realized that we could take conservation one step forward. And that one step forward, as we thought, was to do was something called the grassroots approach. And I'll share a few case studies going forward. And in these grassroots approaches, what we do really is to meet up with individuals in the field uh, of conservation as we go to film for different uh, media houses or for different productions. It's because it is imperative for filmmakers for, to go, uh, for us to go into these um, unknown lands to get these beautiful visuals of animals in the place. And to do so, we also have to collaborate with local people who work on, uh, uh, who work at the very uh, basic level, trying to do conservation or even just understanding what happens. And sometimes there are hunters who actually have more knowledge about uh, uh, a wild animal behavior in a certain uh, remote place like in Nagaland or in uh, or in in Manipur or in Mizoram, who happen to know more about wildlife than most people would. And certainly more organizations, organizations are not working in these landscapes. So that is when it occurred to us that, you know, that we could actually bring up a small change here. And I'd like to share a few instances how we have been able to successfully uh, promote conservation and also help conservation go one step forward. So the first one was when I was filming for the film Naga Pride, which was an award-winning documentary. And in doing so, I had to collaborate with... Uh, Gypsy Tiger, a production house based out of Bombay and WII. But what was most important was the uh, Longling uh, Pong community leader, Nuklu Pong, an individual who had done amazing work in the space. And we all are aware of the Amur Falcon tragedy that uh, struck in 2012, where a massacre had happened and they had killed millions of birds and the WII had to rush to ensure that things were uh, uh, going to normalize. But before 2012, already in 2010, Nuklu Pom had started off a biodiversity reserve in his village. And there, they had stopped all hunting. And, but the problem was this man, he could not go beyond, as an individual, go beyond being an individual. And there is where we thought we could bring in help. So the initiatives we took were to seek help from WI, WTI using our film. We wrote WTI and said, like, listen, there is this particular piece of land in Nagaland which does not see the limelight. It's called Young Yimchen Biodiversity Reserve in the northernmost part of Nagaland. The place that is more known for uh, Amur, Migra Amur falcon migration in, in uh, Nagaland is the uh, other area where the Lothas live, which is where most of us go to f uh, see uh, 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 the Amur falcon migration. So here there was another piece of plant which was already doing conservation without uh, help from outside. And yet he had not seen much of uh, the conservation uh, help that he could receive or he could not take it further. So this is our way of doing it is to reach out to him and then to put him together, put them to the right kind of people who could then help him take conservation forward. So we did this. We sought help from WTI. WTI came by 
and they funded a watchtower building activity and helped uh, uh, Nuklu start off a group of biodiversity in called Lemons and Lock. And today they have been doing really well. So we started helping them with creating different documents of visual, uh, visuals that they could use to promote their conservation. And the biggest achievement I thought was that Nuklu formed with all that he could do and by uh, what little help that Trailing Wild could give him was awarded Whitley Award uh, in 2021. And that was a big breakthrough for us to know that, you know, that we could help in a very, very, very small way for someone to achieve something big. And that is the beauty of conservation and films for conservation. And now in 2023, we still support initiatives taken by Lamentz and Log to undertake conservation in Nagaland. We are also trying to move from uh, Longleng to other districts in Nagaland to see if we can replicate this model as well. The second is of, uh, from the ongoing film uh, that is just about finished filming. I just finished filming two days ago in Bidar called Land, for, Land of Commons. This has to do with uh, grassland conservation. And I'm using um, black bucks as the keystone species or the face of, land, uh, as face of uh, grassland conservation. Here, we started off because thankfully, Jungle Lodges and Resorts, which has a base in Bidar, which has a unit in Bidar, reached out to me and reached out trailing wild and asked if he could do a small two minute. This was during the pandemic and asked if, they, if he could do a two minute for their promotions. And soon enough, the pandemic broke through and we could go to uh, uh, be there to film. And when we were there, we realized that the land had more to offer than just a two minute about black bucks. And then started this initiatives. So a Stoka Foundation is a foundation based out of the US run by an individual called, uh, by an Indian individual who is now a green card holder. His name is Darshan Rangegoda. His foundation helped us with uh, putting together a film that was not just two minutes, but a 20 minute film eventually, which would talk about not just conservation, not just the natural history of the place, but also conservation. And it also helped us collaborate with the different teams that you can see here. Team UI is a local volunteer organization that works on uh, a system of underwater drainage or water system, underwater uh, water harnessing systems that is uh, from the from the uh, Nizam times so or even beyond that. So we could also then reach out to the UNESCO hydrology department, uh, UNESCO hydrology researcher Majid Labaf, who then gave us this whole new perception about how grasslands and uh, the kares, as they are called, is linked to each other. So we found, we all these were the collaborations which led us to then create what was more than just a two minute documentary and a 20 minute documentary happened. So that film will be out uh, by the end of this year or the uh, uh, early next year. Following that, we started off, uh, we started off an initiative to create a bird, a bird survey in the grasslands in that area. So, while I was researching for the film, Land of Commons, I saw that Bidar had very little scientific uh, work that had taken place in that, in, in, in that landscape. And, and the latest paper on, uh, a scientific paper on Bidar conservation happened to be 1995 by Hichin Kumara from Sekon, which was not specifically to do with Bidar itself, but it was just about counting wolves in Karnataka and the mention was Bidar. So that was the latest uh, uh, by wildlife uh, database of be there. And then we realized is that the land is actually missing a lot of baseline data in itself. And so we realized the earliest and the quickest thing that we could do to start the conservation movement and the dialogue in, in be there was to start off with the bird survey. And the bird survey just concluded this July. And the analysis process is, through, is, to, is going on with scientists from IIC and from ATRI will be analyzing this data. And also, what also that did was it led another, be another beautiful study to come through, which was a understanding of anthropogenic noise impact on grassland species. And here, pioneering scient scientists are pioneering with audio, audio uh, equipment, which they have put in the grassland, and they're trying to understand how noise is actually uh, uh, affecting the wildlife and their behavior in the landscape. So 
And to make things better, we have also proposed uh, a bad survey for this place. A recce for the bad survey has been completed. A camera trapping for large mammal surveys are underway. Thanks to the DFO of DCF of this land, who is a, a very thought provoked and uh, forward thinking uh, person. And uh, as they say, when you start doing good things, things start to happen by itself. And just recently, uh, I think uh, 15 days ago, or probably a month ago, the Forest Minister of India, um, Forest Minister of Karnataka, announced that there will be another conservation reserve of black bug in Bidar. And that is a big success for us. So from here, so success uh, in conservation can come from many ways. Sometimes it is driven by individuals where communities are involved like in Nagaland. And sometimes it, is, it also has to incorporate local organizations, the forest department in places like Karnataka, where there's a robust mechanism to deal with conservation issues and uh, where, there's a, where the implications of Wildlife Protection Act can not just uh, mean something for the wildlife betterment, but also for the people who live in this landscape. So then I would like to go back to another uh, such uh, approach that we, had we have taken last year in 2022 in Manipur. So the agenda in uh, Manipur was uh, to film this regenerated forest patch in called Punshi Lock, uh, where a single man had... Uh, single-handedly regrown a patch of forest from nothing, uh, which, is, which is at about 300 acres at this point, and it is still growing. So when we reached there, when we spoke to this person called uh, Moirang Timloya, who runs this Habitat Protection Society called WAPS, we realized that there was beyond what he was doing that needed help. And that was that until that point, there was a lot of films, there were a lot of short films which, was talk, which, which talk about what Loya had done for the land to bring up this 300 acre uh, patch of forest. But what was missing was what animals actually inhabited this forest and how it was actually important for the wildlife of Manipur itself. So then we reached out to a parasitology uh, uh, professor in San Francisco University a National Geographic Explorer himself, who works on this beautiful uh, uh, study where he looks at avian malaria. What it does is to understand how malaria can spread from uh, species-specific malarial uh, mosquitoes to genderless mosquitoes. And it then opens up this idea of how, by cutting down forests, we are actually making way for genderless mosquitoes to come in and then affect normal populations. And today, if we are facing all of these different issues that we are seeing in terms of maybe it could be Corona, it could be SARS or Ebola or the H1N1, all of these have come from these forests, which primary forests, which are not cut down for many, many, many years, which meant parasites like uh, mosquitoes could not go from one host that they were dependent on to another host. But by cutting down forests, we let these genderless mosquitoes to come inside and then would, they would then be able to go from one host to another host and eventually reach humans. And today, these are the issues that we are facing by cutting down forests. So this study is going to be uh, a one of its kind for the reason is because this is a regenerated patch of forest which is hardly found across the world. Regeneration is not something that is taken, out, taken on in full fledged. But here we have a forest that has been standing for the last 25 years. And we can see there's a huge amount of influx of birds that were not present 15 years ago. And then we also did something like a camera trapping exercise where we saw that there were a lot of mammals like leopard cats and munjack and uh, porcupines and civets that were coming into the forest. And they were using this patch of land. And the interesting part is this land is just outside Manipur. It's, it's just outside Imfa. Standing on the in the forest, you can actually hear the noises of the city. That is how close the forest is to the city. And its implications are that this land also has water, which is crucial for the people living around the area. So we thought that, you know, putting all of these things together and then a 360 degree film to give a unique perspective of how the land is and how the people are using the land and how it is, how they are living a very sympathetic li life with the animals living in that area is going to create awareness. But yeah, unfortunately, uh, the results are yet to come is because we know what the situation is in Manipur and hopefully things will turn out to be better off in the coming days. And this 
is our latest uh, approach uh, called the Gibbon story in Arunachal Pradesh. Here we are trying to work with the Idumishmi tribe, which is on the verge of losing a lot of its land to the Dibang Valley uh, project, touted to be the biggest uh, uh, hydroelectric project in Asia. Uh, the Idumishmi will stand to lose not just a huge patch of their community forest, but also uh, a culture that is going to disappear along with this. So we are trying to come out with uh, a documentary film that will talk about this particular issue of the Idumishmi tribe and how they have uh, ingrained attitude towards conservation. One of the uh, quotes that I want to bring about is from uh, a scientist with uh, NCF while he was doing his PhD with uh, uh, the Idumishmi tribe, uh, Dr. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, I forget his name. Sahil Nizwa. He was a tiger scientist. So he ends up in rowing Arunachal Pradesh to set up his camera traps in the Dibang Valley sanctuary. And the, he reaches out to all these elders of the village and asks them as to where he can find a tiger. And it turns out that most of them told that the tigers could be found up in the hill at the, at the very edges of the peaks. He dismisses it saying that it's impossible. Having done uh, uh, tiger research for so many years, I know tigers don't live up there. They always live in the valley below. And then he turns out, he does a camera trap work and turns out that all the tigers, 51 of them, were actually up in the hill. So it talks a whole lot about conservation and how cultural uh, conservation happens and how communities are actually conserving the land and their resources and the wildlife. And they could not have saved tigers, a community of hunters, just out of coincidence. They had to have something ingrained in them. And today that will be lost with this big hydroelectric project and the new uh, rules that is being put in place for uh, the forest management at the highest level. So we would want to take up this story to bring out the actual horrors of what the uh, uh, Idumishmi tribes are going to face along with the uh, animals like the Hulag Gibbon, which is the Eastern Hulag Gibbon, a, a small bunch of Eastern Hulag Gibbons that is found in this area will be facing with the ongoing project. So while we were there to do the recce for the film, we realized that they were they did not understand the, the plant taxonomy of the area and they wanted to do a survey. So we reached out to a professor from Northeast uh, uh, Hill University and we have put them across to the Idumishmi tribe leader who will be taking them across to start off with a plant survey, just like how we started off with the bird survey in Bida. And at this moment, we are trying to raise funds to call for, for a call to action film that will raise these issues that I was just talking about. So these are some of the broad ideas as to how we are, broad, broad approaches to how we're taking across the landscape in India and trying to see how we can connect the people working on the field with the scientists or other resources that they would require to bring about conservation on a realistic way. And also to ensure that we not only bring the support to these people, but also bring up beautiful initiative of documentaries that can be shown to other people and then tell them, listen, this is what is happening in our, in our country. This is what is happening in our own backyard and we need to support this cause. So at this point, I'd like to come down to say that to do all of these things, we require a huge amount of support. We require a huge amount of financial support. We require a huge amount of uh, logistic support and mind, mind space from people who are interested in conservation. And for that, I would really love to thank Rotary Club today to actually have taken time to listen to me and to understand how we all can partner here to go forward and do conservation as individuals, as organizations, as conservationists, as scientific communities, as uh, uh, software engineers or as any individual as we are. So one of the things that we are trying to do is to set up a field station in Bidar and a learning center where, in, where not only will, we carry, will the scientists carry out uh, scientific work uh, like the batch survey or the uh, different baseline data that needs to be collected, at the same time, we are going to look at building social capital, social uh, uh, capital in, in the land that we are working in, is to bring these people and hire all the local people to start helping them with these 
initiatives to scientific initiatives and we are running at the, we just come up with this cost that we need for five years to set up this place and make it a sustainable place so the idea is the first year is when we'll start off all of these things and the, uh, the lot of uh, uh, scientific work will be started off in the first year and in the subsequent four years all of these works will continue empowering the locals building social capital being inclusive and equal to all of these people and then we'll be handing it out to the people to take it forward from there so that is to the, be the field station and the learning center and the other one is the camera trap survey that we want to do for the entire punchy lock area which covers at about uh, 25 square kilometers the initial part of what we was what we are looking at here where we want to understand what is that the land brings to the people and what is it the people are doing for the land and how can they live together in harmony so a camera trap survey is something that we're looking at to understand just the animal movement in this place and to see how this place will change depending on the forest that is generating year on year because this is a regenerated forest patch the third is something that we want to look at is to create a film for wolves of india a species which is highly misunderstood in our country and across the globe for instance very few uh, people actually look wolves uh, in the right way so we would like to bring out a documentary film that not talks about not just the wolves of India, the sympatric species that is living alongside the wolves in these landscapes and the open natural ecosystems and the grasslands that our country has. 24% of India's land is grasslands and open natural ecosystems, while only 2% of it is saved or conserved or, or we could say is under conservation uh, reserves. So I we hope to kind of start a dialogue, start a movement for wolves of India, like how people could uh, start initiatives for tigers of India 15 or 20 or 30 years, 25 years ago. And we can see what it has done for the tigers of India. And we hope to do the same for wolves of India for this film and the conservation issues that we will be taking up along with this. So the next ask is uh, a given story that I was just talking about. That is a recent one that we're talking about, an, an immediate uh, uh, need for the reason is because this Heidel project is almost in its uh, uh, in the, on the verge of beginning. The places have been marked, the land have been purchased, the land for people to come and stay have been built in the forest. A huge land has been cleared in the forest for to build facilities for people working in this project to come and stay. So, if the recent news is to be believed, the work on this project will start sometime next year around this time. So if we have to start a movement to let uh, the world see what is happening and to seek support to ensure that uh, the tribes living in this area, the Idumishmis, don't lose out on their culture and their conservation uh, ish, uh, land, and also the Hula occupants don't lose out on their uh, on their home, or and also that you know like this development can become a sustainable ecosystem friendly one and not comes at the uh, loss of biodiversity and people. And with this, I'd like to uh, end my presentation and say thank you very much for bearing with me, for listening to me and being patient. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suman. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, so, uh... If there are any questions, you can uh, raise your hand or you can put it in the chat box. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would just like to add one thing uh, to what uh, uh, Suman said. So uh, we are all, most of us are Rotarians here and we are all from different clubs. We have, we are here with one con common object in our, you know, uh, mind. Uh, that is wildlife conservation. So every year, every Rotary Club is looking for a meaningful project. I'm sure that, you know, if we can take this particular story to our respective clubs, uh, I'm sure it will be a really a meaningful project for any club to take it up. We can even explore uh, global grant projects uh, um, I mean, where, uh, you know, two uh, different uh, Rotary Clubs from uh, two different countries can partner and 
come together and support. Uh, but for that, uh, Rotary clubs need to take it up as a project. Uh, now, environment is one of the focus area for uh, focus area for uh, Rotary to you know do the service. So I am sure that these uh, issues, what uh, Sumanth is working on, also addresses uh, you know supporting environment. <clears throat> so please take this uh, story uh, to your uh, respective clubs. Um, talk to your board, talk to your presidents, see if something can be taken up as a project, not just from, not uh, only uh, this particular, uh, uh, from this particular session. Uh, we have been having many more sessions uh, like this. We have had many sessions like this in the past. Anything that interests anyone to take it to your club, please do uh, uh, take it and we, we will... Uh, Probably that's how we can do some conservation work. Yeah, thanks, uh, Suman. Yeah, over Thank to you, Subodh. Uh, any, I'm, I'm sure there are some hands raised. Yeah, uh, thanks, Suman. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, Thank you. I would. Uh, somebody had raised their hand. Uh, Arun. Arun, do you have anything to ask? Meanwhile, uh, Sumant, uh, uh, yeah. did you cite any great Indian bustards in this particular area, Bidar? Where uh, uh, There have been reports of uh, bustards in the area. We have seen secondary signs of the animal, but we have not really seen the bird itself. Okay. Uh, but yeah, just, just one, I think in Raichur, there have been sightings. In Koppal, certainly there are sightings of uh, great Indian bustards. But it has a yeah. thriving population of lesser floricans, which is the next uh, stop for us. Oh, all right. Okay. Arun, please go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Arun, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Suman, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful talk. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to check one thing. See, uh, right from uh, uh, childhood, one thing that has fascinated me is the Sangai, which you briefly yeah. mentioned about what's the status? Uh, uh, of it now? Uh, well, uh, if I have to be very honest with you, it is not a very uh, uh, promising uh, story for the Sangai. But the reason is because uh, what happened is uh, the place where Kaibul Namjau National Park, where uh, the floating national park is, the water would usually in the summers would recede and then the organic matter would go settle on the on the forest floor and then would regenerate which, which which would take up all the organic matter and then float back again when the rains would come back in the monsoon but unfortunately there has been a barrage that has been built down the line called the itai barrage which holds water throughout the year which means that the water doesn't recede and the organic matter doesn't have this opportunity to go settle on the ground and collect the organic material that it requires to strengthen so year on year on year, this organic matter that they call pumdi is becoming thinner and thinner, which means the amount of land that these animals can use to walk on has is becoming lesser with each passing year. In fact, the land is about 25 square kilometers, the floating landmass is about 25 square kilometers, but what the animals can actually use is 12 square kilometers, or used to be 12 square kilometers, which is actually reducing year on year. So while Official numbers will tell that the numbers are increasing year on year, but I hardly doubt it. It's because I doubt it really. I hardly believe it. Uh, the reason is because even when I was there in 2016 to film at the Sangai, I spent 15 days, eight hours from morning till evening, sitting in my hide, watching grass grow. It took 15 days for me to actually see a site of Sangai. And if if we were to go by the numbers that the officials are presenting with about 200 odd individuals in a 12 square kilometer area, you should be probably seeing them everywhere, isn't it? They'll probably be seeing more Sangai than grass itself, but that's not true. That's not true at all. And yeah, so uh, sorry, to, uh, just to add to it, the problem is that uh, there is also a sympatric species that lives along with the Sangai called uh, the hog deer. The hog deer looks very similar to a Sangai female. 
But the difference is when the hawk deer actually lifts its tail, you can see the white behind its tail, while the, the Sanghai doesn't do that. So there's a, uh, people would misidentify hawk deer for Sanghai. And that also happens during the official survey, which is very unfortunate, but yes, that is the status really in the place. So much, uh, uh, so month, one, one small query, whether the, there have been some, this one, which I've been reading, of course, I don't have much of the, sorry, bookish knowledge that I have, uh, that they also go to the hills from the uh, water, that Pumdi area, the floating vegetation area. Is it true? Uh, or uh, they uh, they also, not just on the Pumdi, they're also dependent on the other vegetation as well. Uh, is it is it right, what I've heard? So the park itself has three uh, main hills. Uh, they're called Chings, the Toya Ching, the uh, Pabo Ching, are the main hills in, in Kabulungo, which... Uh, has watchtowers, which means there are people going and coming out. And there are these uh, canal, uh, there are these uh, small channels in which people take boats to go through for the sake of recreation or for collection of uh, uh, matter or uh, pundi matter or for collection of uh, sea, uh, sorry, uh, water plants and things. So while in practice, they might have used the hills to rest. They probably even do so in the night, uh, in the night, but uh, Yes, that probably is very, very little, very small percentage of time is actually spent on uh, hillocks by these animals. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so. Um, Deanne. Thanks, Sarun, for your questions. Uh, yeah, Deanne, would you like to go ahead? Uh, would you unmute yourself, please? I, I did. Yeah, please. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you so hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Okay. okay. I'm a Deanne, and I'm in Missouri in the middle of the United States, and I've seen a lot of presentations from National Geographic, and you're right. I have no idea of anything about in India. I've seen all of Africa and the Amazon, and I think we need to become more aware and I had no idea there were wolves. I mean, I've seen wolves in the United States, but I've not heard about wolves in, in uh, India. So you're right. We need to all become more aware of what's around us and in other nations. So great presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Dian. I'm glad you liked it. I just want to add one point to what Anne was just saying is that India is India has about 45,000 different species of animals, and it is a growing number. And yet, we have seen about six or probably seven species on the mainstream media. So there's a lot to be explored, a lot to be, lots to be seen. Thanks, thanks, Anne, for your comment. Thank you. Anybody else would like to ask something? Both there is a question in the chat box. Uh, uh, just uh, this is by Anushka Puri. I uh, shall I read it out? Yeah, please. Uh, hello, thank you for your insightful commentary. I am currently a grade 12 student and as someone interested in pursuing conservation as a career, what is uh, what is something uh, you came across early on in your career that inspired you or changed any of your perspectives? This could be anything in general, like a book, documentary, news article, etc. Et oh, very interesting question. Uh, well, I'll cut a very, very long story short. Uh, so this was in school. I was a very naughty kid, and I used to be thrown out of class more often than I was inside the class. It's because the teachers would feel easier to uh, handle me. Uh, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, the teachers would actually feel easier handling me out of the class than inside. And my school was a had a big uh, backyard. We had a really big school. And uh, we had this area where we used to call it a swamp. So the, all, all the rainwater would gush, would gush into this place. And, and often when I would get thrown out of class, this is the place I used to spend my time. Like sit there and watch these little... Uh, geckos burst into life or frogs calling or uh, snakes hunting these little stuff and this is what kind of inspired me but one thing that really got me interested and got me really hooked on to wildlife was what my uh, headmistress did in school 
she was an Anglo-Indian and uh, for some odd reason, she thought it was good idea for, it was not a good idea for kids to go out and get burnt in the summer sun, but instead put us in a classroom whenever we had this free hour and make us watch these beautiful wildlife documentaries that she would get back from her, get back from England whenever she visited her family. That hook got me hooked. And this was way early in my life when I was in my, when I was in my fifth grade or my sixth grade. So I guess that was what was my inspiration for being in my life. And it just kept growing inside and it just came out one fine day and then, yeah, there I am. That's very interesting. Uh, we'll move on to our next question. Uh, Krishnamurti, would you like to go ahead, please? Please unmute yourself. Uh, Krishna, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yeah, I don't have a question to ask. I have something to add. Uh, D and Ma'am was uh, commenting about a uh, lack of enough films about uh, Indian wildlife. I just wanted to uh, bring to her and everybody's notice that whenever this uh, Beetle documentary is going to be out, Right, it's for a non-profit purpose and it's purely for educational purpose, right? So it will be out for consumption by all and we request all your help to, you know, uh, make it as popular as possible. Grasslands aren't well understood by uh, many people in India, right? Uh, we would like to use that documentary for educating people about open natural ecosystems, grasslands in particular. Right. Yeah, that was, that, that was uh, succinctly put. Thanks, Krishna. That actually will be out in, uh, by the end of this yeah, year. I would like to add one more. Yeah, we finished. Sure, sure, sure. Please go ahead. So, uh, while someone talked about how uh, each individual has been able to uh, contribute in his or her own way to conservation, uh, we would like to acknowledge the help that we received from Jitanjali there. Right. For the Manisha, uh, for the Manipur initiative, we needed uh, some laptops to get started with. Gitanjali Dar was uh, more than willing to uh, give us a few spare laptops. It's unfortunate that uh, the usage has been paused because of the situation at Manipur. But uh, she helped us with that. Uh, we needed help with uh, shooting something in Oman for the Beedle documentary. We needed uh, an interview of the professor, uh, the UNESCO hydrology professor. Uh, Sanjay Swar was willing to help us. Uh, eventually, it uh, turned out to be a Zoom interview. But we would like to acknowledge the help received from Sanjay sir as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I sorry if I miss miss mentioning these two things, but I'm I have to admit that you know all along the way we have been really really lucky to have a lot of people, including Krishna himself, who has been uh, supporting us in many many ways. Krishna and uh, Sanjay sir and Gitanjali. I mean the list goes on. The, uh, I don't think uh, conservation is possible by individuals. It, it has to be a group effort. And I'm really, really glad that people are actually coming forth and uh, supporting us in our initiatives. In fact, we should also thank Krishna for uh, bringing you as our speaker today. Uh, thanks, Krishna. Yeah, our next question is by young Ayman. Ayman, please go ahead. Unmute yourself, please. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, firstly, sir, thank you for the presentation. Um, lots of information for me. Um, so my question is, when it comes to conservation films, um, how how big does a project have to be to have some kind of an impact in whatever uh, way it can, in whatever, uh, whatever scale of impact? How big does a project have to be or how big does a film have to be? <clears throat> create that change? Ah, nice question, Mayam. So like I was just mentioning while I was showing this uh, small two-minute of the hornbills, it was done during the pandemic when the rest of the, when all of us were actually sitting in, in our rooms. So all, it, all that it required was a, a few amount of clips that I uh, had shot earlier, or sometimes because these are conservation messages that you're trying to put across and not commercial activities, you can actually source footage Creative Commons footage are available. You can reach out to people like me or to rest of the world community out there and ask for footage that you require. So it doesn't really have to be a big, it doesn't actually require money at all. 
sometimes all these conservation issues can be shot on your phone itself. And you can give a voiceover, you can just put text on it. All you might probably require is some help editing. If you already know it, then you don't even need that. Uh, it does not require fancy uh, 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 narrators or you don't need this seductive narrators to come and tell you these things in this beautiful voice. It doesn't have to have this great, in, uh, great looking uh, uh, visuals. It can have meaningful uh, images that can talk about the issue at hand. It can have uh, a very little narration and just text. So it can be done as, with as little as just an iPhone or uh, any phone that, for instance, that you have in your hand. And if, if, if time and money is around, then you can probably do it bigger and make it even more uh, 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 beautiful and more far reaching. So yes, it, it is out for you to do it as you like. Does it answer my question? Uh, answer your question, sorry. Yes, yes, thank you. Suman, so uh, there is a message for you, Sumant, from yes. Prem Ayapa. Yes. Uh, if you haven't already, you should connect with GB Pulu at Rowing Arunachal, who manages a community forest close by there. We so are. With he... GB Pulu. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, next, uh, JJ Jankiram, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Sumant. Uh, see, uh... Whenever you talk about conservation and environment and other things, uh, people start talking about uh, planting trees here and there and then uh, seed ball throwing and all those things. So I think that's uh, more of an uh, unscientific way of doing things. So are you doing anything in this regard so that uh, the common people, uh, children, they get uh, some scientific idea of how uh, conservation can be done and uh, uh, how this uh, forestation can help uh, the environment? in a more scientific way. Uh, right. I think uh, I, we are not doing anything at this point, but we can certainly put you across to the people who have taken this up uh, and uh, doing it currently also and have done it in the past uh, successfully and doing it well as well scientifically. Uh, while that also brings me to that point of how Punchi Lock has been regenerated uh, in Manipur, where it was just a one man's vision of wanting to grow a forest. So it was more an intuitive uh, um, thing than about uh, than a scientific approach, where he actually went, spoke to his uh, forefathers and his ancestors, uh, sought advice from his grandfather and his uh, and his and his other contemporaries to understand what forest actually existed there, and tried to replace the land or try to uh, reforest the land with the same kind of species. That is that is very preliminary as to how. Uh, uh, reforestation can be done. But uh, yes, there is a scientific approach to it. There are people uh, in the field who are currently working on these uh, aspects, like WWF is working in BR Hills to regenerate uh, grass in the forest by removing the lantana. Uh, Jairam, uh, sorry, uh, not Jairam Ramesh, uh, Ramesh Venkatraman of Junglescapes has uh, successfully uh, done that in uh, Bandipur. So there are quite a few examples. And if anybody is interested, we are more than glad to put you across to them. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another message uh, and some questions for you in the chat box. Yes. Uh, this is Jaden from the Rotary Club of Accra Ligon, uh, Ghana. Right. And uh, Jaden would like to say that, yeah, it's a very insightful presentation. Uh, what keeps you going in pursuing this career? Has something ever scared you while pursuing this? So do, have you had any scary moments? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yes, I, yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't really want to uh, play up those moments because I'm sure everybody, especially people living in Bangalore, uh, face more scarier moments every morning when they go out to work and to uh, work to their offices than I probably would in a forest. But yes, they do come with a share of uh, um, moments where uh, it can be scary. Uh, one incident was just when I was in uh, Manipur recently uh, trying to set up this camera trap and uh, a communal tension flared up. And we were just in the middle of it. And though we did not face any trouble as such, um, uh, yeah, the situation was not making us feel great about where we were and what was happening. And what is even more fearful is the fact is that if this happened to reach the forest and if the forest gets plundered because of this, there is where I think is the biggest loss to us. Dan, uh, uh, personally, uh, I think uh, 
personal losses uh, would not mean so much as much as uh, loss to the forest. Uh, but one incident that I would like to recount is uh, on, in my first year of filming for uh, wildlife. I had just come out of Nikon as a as a uh, fresh filmmaker, and uh, we had set out uh, to do a eight part documentary film for uh, CEPF and A3. Uh, uh, I'll not take names and places, but I just tell you the incident. And we were in go, uh, we were in this place trying to film a mining activity, and uh, all of a sudden it really went bad, and we had huge number of people come in, and uh, we were just shoved around. We were dragged and uh, put into a, a small, tiny room. It was almost like a hostage situation. Uh, people barging in in every moment and threatening to kill us and throw our bodies away and stuff and uh, trying to break our equipment and everything until uh, the mine owners intervened. And uh, when we ex explained, the uh, explained our predicament to them, saying that we were just trying to do a documentary on livelihoods in the Western Guards uh, uh, and not really trying to showcase mines in a negative way or anything, which was not actually true. But yeah, uh, we had to kind of lie ourselves out of the situation. And uh, uh, they had to mock, arrest us, the police had to come, because there were uh, people living uh, on the hill below, uh, who mostly were mine workers, had this information that we were there to uh, do a film on how mines was uh, negatively affecting the biodiversity, which actually what we were doing, really. But so they were paying for our blood. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, so we had to be mock arrested by the police and taken away in the police jeep and then made sure that we were safe. So there are incidents. I wouldn't say they're, this is for the faint hearted. This is certainly requires uh, a strong, strong will and a mad head. I would say you just have to be crazy to be doing this. Wildlife well, conservation is certainly for not the faint hearted. Uh, what keeps me going is, well, I mean, I, I, my my love for my life or uh how would i say this is like i grew up as a kid who enjoyed the thrills of swinging from a branch of a tree or running about in the uh, in the mud uh, running about in open fields rolling in mud and enjoyed the thrills of a kid and it really hurts for me to see the kids of today sit in front of a computer day long uh, watch movies or play on their phones and i don't think that is how we should be living I don't think that is the right way for kids to be living. And now with a one-year-old in my house, my kid was just born a year ago. The, I think the motiv motivation level to uh, bring back uh, the life that we had earlier has just kicked in and is that much more uh, higher. So I guess these little things always keep me motivated to go ahead and continue my work. interesting uh, thanks for sharing your experiences uh, anybody else uh, with any final quick questions that was very well answered sumant uh, <laughs> well. uh, thank you thank you sanjay okay so i think if we if we don't have any more questions we are uh, done with our one hour of uh, a meeting today uh, anyone else? One last quick question or I'm any comment? Glad, I'm glad to sit here as long as people have questions for me. <laughs> sure. We will probably have more sessions. This month. Uh, oh, I'm glad. I, I'm, I'm really glad if uh, uh, people really like what I had to offer them today. And, oh, and really up to the people. Yeah. Arun has another question. So. Arun, Arun, has... please. Arun, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Sumanth, <laughs> I've been really intently hearing it. And I feel that you know, maybe I'm slightly, now I'm a bit old to uh, rough it out like you. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> so now, now thing, one point I just wanted to check out. You're talking of the whole occupants. Right. So, uh, you, you, you know, when you say northeast, it's quite an expanse. So there is a population of gibbons in Assam. Uh, I, I really, I mean, maybe towards the northeastern part of portion of Assam, perhaps, you know, uh, towards uh, Bhutan or uh, that portion and uh, Arunachal and these. And of course, they are all, uh, I mean, they're, they're all 
in isolated pockets i mean they are fragmented heavily fragmented i feel so mm. uh, is it are these uh, distinct populations of different uh, you know, is there a spatial uh, uh, different differentiation or are they one single uh, species like you know further we have towards thailand we have similar species as we go down southeast asia right. we have the gibbon species so how are uh, are these you know any kind of uh, genetic studies have been done in terms of uh, uh, spatial uh, differentiation uh, as we stand here today arun uh, uh, they have they i think in india we have two separate groups of gibbons one is the eastern hula gibbon other is the western hula gibbon most of what we find in the assam area is the western hula gibbon the chitwin river in burma is is the differentiating uh, point as where uh, the ones on the eastern side of the uh, uh, river are the eastern hula gibbons and the western are uh, the western hula gibbons but there has been a lot of uh, debate over this and i think only recently there was a paper which said they are actually not two distinct uh, 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 varieties but they are just the same uh, one with a slight morphological difference which does not really account for making it a subspecies in itself so uh, the studies are still ongoing but as we stand here today as much as, as conclusive evidence has at this point we know there are two spe- subspecies in india the eastern and the western hula gibbon and the one that we are working is a small uh, 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 group of i i don't know how many individuals are actually there because there has not been a survey that has been carried out in arunachal pradesh and rowing but gb said that they will be doing something soon but that is a isolated patch of eastern hula gibbons in that area uh, does that answer your question arun yes it does suman uh, we could uh, move on uh, there's one question from uh, manu chandaria who would like to know whether you had any experience in the kenya tanzania uh, part of uh, africa oh no not really uh, i haven't been to africa at all manu i hope it can happen soon if you are in that part of the world and if you think we can provide our services please do let us know we'd be more than glad to come in there uh would you be comfortable sharing any contact information because people would like to get in touch with you uh, either email or whatever your uh, absolutely sharing yeah when I mean, you can visit my site and you'll find the name and everybody i can also put in my email id which you can directly reach out to me on if you can ch- type it out in the chat box for everyone that would be great right away so this would be my email id and uh, i'd be more than happy to answer any questions or reach out uh, to contact anybody or get in touch with anybody who would like to one yeah, thank you for that probably one last question why yes. is it railing wild sumant oh yes. okay right, nice thanks <laughs> all right so that is what we do we are just trailing the wild i don't think we are the ones who are ahead and the wild is not behind us i think we are all going behind the wilderness and the wildlife and understanding i believe in in our movies we are trying also to tell stories that is going to kind of uh, uh, give us more understanding of how animals are using the landscape uh, so very well and uh, how these animals have evolved over so many generations and so many uh, years millions of years and yet have lived a uh, altruistic simple life and get know how to live very well i think there's a lot for us to learn from the wild so we are always trailing it and trying to learn from it and that is something that we also want to kind of showcase through our films absolutely unfortunately wilderness is also trailing <laughs> uh yes which is really really painful and i hope uh, we can reverse the trend soon absolutely thank you Uh, uh yeah sumant uh, so before we wrap up uh, i'd just like to make a comment and uh, i was really uh, uh what what can i use uh, i was uh, what you said was very inspiring in terms of uh, you know of course we don't know too many uh, wildlife photographers directly but uh, going by your passion and uh, uh, 
your efforts in not only filming wildlife but also helping in conserve wildlife mm-hmm. and uh, educate people i think that's where uh, it makes a big difference so i think you're doing great work and uh, uh, let's see uh, a fellowship would love to you know team up with you sometime and see how we can work together thank so, you uh, So that's it for today i guess uh, no uh, other questions your kind Finish. words thank you it really means a lot to hear such uh, positive notes thank you very much thank you all thank you for joining uh, we will see you on the 5th of next month uh, probably we will have something to uh, bring you from the bandipur side what uh, sumanth was talking about uh, you know uh, the lantana eradication uh that's what we are looking at uh see you all soon thank you see you all thank you again for being here today fantastic talking to you bye thank you so much thank you thank you all for joining